Welcome. This is our first video getting into the Book of Enoch. Now, the Book of Enoch here is the most intriguing, the most interesting, the, one of the most powerful books in the whole entire scope of Scripture. Now, as we get into this, you will see, you'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean and in, in, in why I say what I say. So let's read the Book of Enoch, chapter 1. This is the words of the blessing of Enoch, or Henoch in the original Hebrew, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. Now, as you see here, there are little numbers here I got um, by certain passages here. And I'm going to get into a little bit of things here. Now, I'm, I'm not going to get into everything. I, I am... Uh, I've got a whole bunch of scripture references down here. But the book of Enoch here was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, you might say, so what? What does that mean to me? That proves that the book of Enoch was in existence at least. Now, I believe it was in existence from the days of Enoch. But we know for sure we've got evidence, hard evidence, that it was in existence at least 200 years before the time of Christ. And a lot of the New Testament, a lot of, of what we read in the so-called New Testament is taken from the book of Enoch. And we can, we can say that because we know that the book of Enoch was in existence, was known and read by people back then. We, we know that by the early church fathers, the writings of the early church fathers who referenced Enoch in the book of Enoch. So putting it all together, we can say that the book of Enoch was the foundation of Scripture. It's very, very vital to understand this. I, I, I'm not sure if you saw my video, you know, the 10 questions that you must ask when studying the Scriptures. One of it is, is who wrote this book? When was it written? Like, what's the culture? What's the context here? The context of the book of Enoch was, is actually the first book that was ever written if you were looking in the book of Jubilees, what we read in previous uh, readings is that uh, Henoch, Enoch himself, was the first one to actually be literate, the first one to actually write. But he was the first one to actually write something down. He was the first one to write and to, you know, to read and write and to teach others to do so as well. Let's get into this piece by piece here. The words of the blessing of Henoch. Now, this whole book is talking, there's a lot of stuff in this book. There's a lot of stuff about God's judgment, God's wrath, God's, you know, looking after his righteous people, his elect. This is considered to be the blessing of Henoch, okay? Now, the blessing of Enoch in this book is not as the same kind of blessing as you is what, what you might think of that would be coming from church leaders today, okay? Henoch is not, um, he just doesn't bless, you know, just doesn't do a blanket bless on everybody. He singles out, these people are the blessed, these people are not blessed, okay? These people are the elect, these people are not the elect. These people are the sinners, these people are the saints, so to speak. The words of the blessing, keep that in mind. This book is the blessing of Henoch. We need to really understand this. We need to really know this, read this, and understand this. Wherewith he blessed the elect. Now, I'm not going to get into every single reference I got here, but I will give you a little bit of a preview of the, uh, the references. So these scripture references are actually tying the book of Enoch very tightly to the Bible, okay? You need to re realize, again, that the book of Enoch was in existence before any of the apostles of, of Yeshua were in existence, before any of the books, you know, from Matthew to Revelation were in existence. This book was in existence long before that. This book was, writ was read and understood by many people in that day in that culture we need to understand that so seeing that the scriptures say that enoch was the first to actually write read and write and he and his book is arguably the oldest book in the world 
This particular term, the elect, is of particular interest because we see this term throughout the scriptures. Now I'm going to take you to another um, pass, another uh, screen here. Now this is some of the passages in the scriptures that we see that uh, refer to the elect. Okay, very interesting. Okay, Isaiah says, They shall not build, and another inhabit. They shall not plant, and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. In other words, they'll live a long time. And mine elect. Here we go again. Where did Isaiah get this term from? Elect. Hmm. I wonder. Okay. Again, I personally believe that the book of Enoch was in existence from the days of Enoch, which makes it the oldest book, the oldest document in the world. <laughs> Hands down, the oldest in the world. So whatever comes after that, which sounds like it, is taken from it. Okay, I mean, if uh, in 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 today's culture, for example, if I if I write a little document or a newspaper argue, uh, article that says you know to be or not to be, that is the question. Um, if I say that, most people will say, hmm. That sounds like uh, Shakespeare, you know, uh, I guess, he, I mean, most people would just automatically know that I'm taking that from Shakespeare, okay? Now, when the prophets, the apostles, when the men of God in the scriptures refer to the elect, we must do the same thing. We must, uh, you know, automatically say it, they are referring to what Hanok, what Enoch was already talking about centuries before, you know, if not millennia before that, you know, before the, these scriptures were written. They don't just pull it out of the hat. They don't just pull these terms out of the hat. They speak like this because they are familiar with the writings of Enoch and they're familiar with the terminology that's used in the writings of Enoch. Matthew 24, okay, uh, this is, uh, these are the words of Yeshua, the words of Jesus, the Messiah, for there shall arise false Christs or false messiahs and false apostles. We've got a lot of that today. Uh, in particular, apostles of big religions, okay, or I, I should say false prophets, uh, in particular, um, in particular, prophets of big religions, okay, and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Here we go again, Yeshua. Jesus himself is using this word elect. And Jesus goes on in verse 31 saying, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect. Okay. Here, Jesus is talking about God the Father uh, gathering his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Again, the elect here, the elect. This is not just something that is pulling out of a hat. Jesus, Yeshua, is using the same terminology as Enoch did because everybody knew the book of Enoch because it, it existed back then. It was read. It was part of the, it was part of the, you know, the, the library of holy scriptures. Mark chapter 22, we go again with a different account of what Yeshua said about the last days, saying, he said, For false Christs and false apostles shall rise and, sh and shall sh uh, show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Here we go again, the elect. Go on, going on to verse 27, and he says, And there shall, and then shall he send, he being God, the Father, send his angels, and so gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Okay, Luke chapter 18, Jesus said again, And shall not God avenge his own elect? <laughs> How many times do we, have, do we read this in the scriptures? Ro Romans chapter 8 verse 33, Paul the apostle says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Again, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, oh, excuse me there. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, 
humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Once again, in Titus, Paul says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and to and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, Peter, the apostle, says, the elect, speaking about the elect people of God, elect co- according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, how many times do we read it in the scriptures? The elect, the elect, the elect, the elect. Now, we can say without a shadow of a doubt that that the apostles, the prophets, get a lot of their inspiration, a lot of their terminology, a lot of their faith, if it were, from the book of Enoch. Okay, so let's go back to the book of Enoch and let's continue. And righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation. Okay, who will be living in the day of tribulation. Okay, now, here we're talking about, now this is kind of going against the notion of modern day Christian teaching of the rapture. Okay, now, the scriptures do declare there is a rapture. Okay, it says that he will again gather together all of his elect from the, from all of the earth, okay? But when will that happen? It will happen when Yeshua, Jesus, comes back with ten thousands of his saints and, and, and the elect that are living at that time will join those, those apostles or those saints, those, those, the elect that Jesus comes back with and fight the great and final war, Okay? that the scriptures do not teach that we we are taken out of the earth and seven years later we come back again. That somehow Jesus sneaks in a second time. No one knows it. Just everybody disappears. And then he comes back the third time. That's not what the scriptures say. And I know some of you will say, well, it says one will be taken and the other left and one will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. The apostle says, where, Lord? And he says, where the body lies. There the vultures will gather, Okay. Speaking of death, okay, he, the, the scriptures say that there will be a taking away and then there will be a taken up, so to speak. Taken away speaks of being taken away in death. As it says in Isaiah chapter 57, you take the righteous away. Why do you take the righteous away? Why do they perish? Why do the righteous perish? Why are they taken away? Why do they die? Because it says that God is sparing them from the evil to come. Okay? So, yes, there will be many righteous people dying in the, in, you know, in the last day and before the tribulation. Just like I, I mentioned before in the previous video that Methuselah was a sign of when he dies, he will be like the, la- the last righteous man to die, uh, excluding Noah and his family, before the flood comes. Okay, so there will be a dying away of righteous people. There will be a, a, a purging, so to speak, of righteous people. They, they will die before the great tribulation. But yet there will be a lot. There will be some righteous people that will go through the tribulation. Okay, living in the day of tribulation, as it says here in the book of Enoch. When all the wicked and godless are to be removed, okay? The day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed, okay? Now, this is the opposite to um, some of the, again, the modern-day Christian teaching about the rapture where the righteous are removed. No, the righteous will be removed by death. Yes, many of them will. Most of them will. Not all of them. Some will go through the tribulation just as Noah and his family went through the flood, Yet, at the end of that tribulation, Jesus comes back, Yeshua comes back, the Messiah, Mashiach, comes back with all of his saints and those who are still living in the day of tribulation, just as Noah and his family were still in the ark, you know, in the day of the flood, will be taken up, joined together with Yeshua and fight against the wicked and the godless, which Yeshua will come back 
to remove the wicked and the godless. Okay, that's what it's all about. The tribulation, birth pains, like like birth pains, where the earth is going more and more and more into pain and sorrow, suffering until at the very end the wicked, the wicked and the godless are to be removed by the Messiah Yeshua himself and by his saints. And he took up his parable and said, Chenok, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw a vision of the Holy One in the heavens, a vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me, and from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come, okay? Ho, oh, this is very, very important to understand. Chenok, Enoch, wrote this book, specifically saying this is not for his generation, but for a remote generation to come, which I believe is our generation. We are a remote generation from Chenok, from Enoch. Enoch, our great, 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 great times 10 to the power of who knows how many, grandfather, he is our great, great, great grandfather, actually wrote this for us. Okay? He wrote this for us. How amazing, how awesome this is. Concerning the elect, I said, and I took up my parable concerning them. The great, or excuse me, the holy great one will come forth from his dwelling. And the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai. Okay, that talks about this. There's a lot of talks about this in Exodus chapter 19, verse 11. Let me scroll this up so you can see it. Exodus chapter 19, verse 11. Uh, and verses 16 to 18, Moshe, Moses wrote about this, that the, ho great, the, holy, the great one will come forth from his dwelling and the eternal God will tread upon the earth even on Mount Sinai. Now, Enoch here is prophesying about the great coming of God in the day of Moshe, in the day of Moses. Isn't this, this is amazing because this is like, how many hundreds of years, how many even, you know, how many, how, uh, how many hundreds of years before Moshe even existed, before Moses was even born, Enoch wrote this prophesying about how God will show up on Mount Sinai, you know, with Moses. It says here, and appear from his camp and appear in the strength of, of his might from the heaven of heavens. And all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers shall quake. All shall be smitten with fear. You remember how the people, when, when, when God came down on Mount Sinai, on Mount Sinai, and the people were so afraid, they all shook, and they said, don't, don't, we, don't, we can't take this anymore. Moses, you go up, and you, 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 uh, you talk to God for us. You, you hear from God for us. You come and tell us what he said. We can't take this no more. They're, they're smitten with such fear. And the, and the watchers shall quake. The watchers, again, being the angels. Or as in Hebrews, it calls them the great cloud of witnesses. The watchers. And great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. Again, we read about this in the scriptures. Or we will read about this in our, in our future studies. And the high mountains shall be shaken and the hills shall be made low. Okay, let's scroll down here. And shall melt like wax before the flame. Okay, verse 11. Now, let me just scroll up here to go to verse 11. Now, there are several places in the scriptures that talk about the earth melting like wax in the presence of God. So, I mean, everything that Enoch says here is all in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. And we can actually say that if this is the true writings of Enoch, which I believe it is, then all of these other scriptures in the Bible, now you see all these scripture references up here. Like there are, 
Countless scripture references here. Look at this. Countless scripture references. And they all refer back to the book of Enoch. They all basically just repeat what the book of Enoch already said. Now, the book of Enoch, written by Enoch, is, is looking forward into the future when, when God comes upon the earth with Moshe. Okay? Uh, verse 7. And the earth shall be wholly rent in sunder, uh, torn in two. And all that is upon the earth shall perish. And they shall, and there shall be a judgment upon all men. Now, this again could be talking about a coming judgment or a previous judgment, which was, you know, for example, the days of Noah. You know, the days of Noah, where in the days of Noah, it says the flood came and all perished. Verse 8. But with the righteous, he will make peace. That's, again, throughout the scriptures, throughout the Bible, we read about how God makes peace, peace specifically with the righteous. And will protect the elect, and mercy shall be upon them. Okay, it doesn't say mercy shall be upon those who are not elect, but upon the elect. And they shall all belong to God, and they shall be prospered, and they shall all be blessed. And he will help them all. And light shall appear unto them. You know, doesn't this sound familiar? Like, you know, uh, where it says in Isaiah that the, you know, the light of God shines upon you. And he will make peace with them. And behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones. This is what Jude, Yehuda, prophesied. You know, the half-brother of Yeshua prophesied. In his book, and we're going to get to we're going to get to that when we start reading his book. That he comes, he comes, he comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. This is talking again about Yeshua to execute judgment upon all. Now, this isn't literally doesn't literally mean, mean ten thousands. It could mean millions or billions. I mean, because they didn't have those kind of big numbers uh, in their vocabulary back then. So, to execute judgment upon all. And to destroy all the ungodly, and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now I'm just going to leave it right there for now. That's Enoch, the book of Enoch, chapter 1. So don't miss the next video when we get into the book of Enoch, chapter 2. Thanks for watching.